throughout the ages, religious freedom and freedom to love and have families and to pursue our own sense of joy and happiness in the freedom and security of a wonderful, blessed country. <coughs> that, that gift continues to have to be fought. And we ask thy blessings and the strength as our troops face new adversities throughout the Far East. And I think this day Brooks will share with us what's at stake and how we indeed need to pray and work together as a community to support those who will be in the vanguard of dealing with some very threatening um, religious uprising throughout the world. Uh, thank you, dear Lord, to live in this great country. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the family and friends that we enjoy and the liberties of loving you and worshiping you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Yes, I can summarize the Old Testament reading very quickly. Who knew that camels could bring people together? Uh, yes, gentlemen, if you have a woman that says, I'll water you and your camels, you say yes. That's the Old Testament message today. I, I, I think Paul also has a wonderful, I could have written each one of those words with many examples attached. Um, I don't want to go there, though, uh, just today. Where I'd like to go is uh, the comments that I shared with our interfaith uh, worship service on Friday. Never have I been more aware, I think it's just age, I don't know, I've never been more aware of what all of the words in these hymns, in these prayers, all the speeches that are read at this time of the year on July 4th, how significant they are in contrast. Um, July, uh, excuse me, June 29th, just a few short days ago, something, two things happened very significantly, by contrast. On June 29th, whether you saw it or not, the bodies of three Israeli teenage boys were found. They had been kidnapped and murdered. On that same day, parenthetically, I'll tell you that uh, a Palestinian teenage boy, right outside of Jerusalem, was also kidnapped and murdered in reprisal two days later. On that same day, however, June 29th, there was an announcement from the sands of the Middle East, Syria, we think. The announcement came from a group calling itself the Islamic State, originally the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, ISIS, or ISIS. They changed their name a little bit later to the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. The Levant is an older British term for the entire Middle East. They've amended their name a third time in the past week. They now call themselves simply, with the definite article, the Islamic State. This is the Sunni branch of the Islamic family. Its leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, on June 29th, announced to the world a caliphate. You may have missed this. A caliphate. And he announced that he himself, al-Baghdadi, would now be referred to as the caliph. If you're missing your medieval history, the caliph is an Arabic title for the supreme leader in direct succession to the Prophet Muhammad himself. The announcement of a caliphate announces a complete religious, political, and cultural authority over all Muslims anywhere in the world, first. Secondarily, it's an announcement that after the Muslims comes all of us. Caliphs ruled not only religiously, they ruled everybody in the medieval Islamic world. Don't miss the timing. Just a few days before July 4th, we get the announcement that there is a worldwide uh, authority, religious authority, coming towards every one of us. Most recent intelligence suggests that Mr. Uh, Al-Baghdadi's uh, aim 
is to create a religious Islamic state in nations that we refer to today as Jordan, Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, Kuwait, Cyprus, southern Turkey, and eastern Turkey. This is the goal. The announcement of the Caliphate also means that the strictest interpretation of Islamic law, you know the word in Arabic, it's called Sharia law. The strictest interpretation of that law now applies within all the areas under the control of ISIS. That means particularly Christians and Shia Muslims, the other side of the family of Islam, are being particularly targeted. How? Since the announcement of the Caliphate, a Sharia law has brought us numerous beheadings. And if intelligence reports are accurate in Syria, up to eight crucifixions. Would you like to guess, as I strongly suspect, who is being crucified? Christians. I don't have that 100%, but I strongly suspect the evidence is there, and we would ultimately find that out. Mr. al-Baghdadi also invited all jihadis everywhere, no matter what branch. This is the man that thinks al-Qaeda is too lenient. He's invited all jihadis to immediately join with ISIS or face immediate execution upon capture, and he has started to uh, uh, initiate that policy on the ground. Friends, this is not an anti-Islamic message. This is an anti-terrorism message. This is an anti-darkness message. It's actually a pro-Jesus message. What did we just celebrate? What's at stake? What, by contrast, does the world look like if all of us were to disappear, and our country also? I realized, and I had this thought marching through that parade, that the words of Jesus are all we have to stand against a darkness and a world that's vicious like this. As Christians, we are called to stand against any darkness and to bring the light of Christ into places with courage and conviction and sacrifice. What do you say? What does one say to Sharia law implemented like this? Come unto me, all you who are burdened heavily, and I will give you rest. Cast your cares upon me, Jesus says, in a voice that is so distinctive. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. You will find, Jesus says, shalom for your soul. Peace at the deepest level of the human experience. This is a voice that Jesus always speaks with, and yet sometimes we never hear him. Can I tell you that Jesus was using an image that was so clear to the people of his time. If you didn't grow up on a farm, you may have missed this image. I didn't know until I had lived in the Holy Land, and I had studied this particular passage that when the beasts of burden, the oxen generally, or horses, whatever they were using, are yoked together, do you know that they're never equal? There's always one that's the leader and one that's the follower. The yoke on the lead animal is heavier and it's thicker to bring the other animal with it. Jesus is saying, don't lift up the whole world yourself. God has the heavy yoke. God will bear the burden. God leads and we follow. It's a beautiful, it's a comforting, it's such a dramatic image. 
for people that feel like they are literally holding up the yoke and the plow and the whole rest of the world on our shoulders. There is no darkness that can extinguish a statement like that. Isn't it beautiful? As Christians, we need to stand, I believe, and claim who we are and who God is when we are faced with challenges in the world like this. We get to stand in this valley as interfaith believers. What we do in this chapel, what we do in the Beaver Creek Chapel, the Vale Chapel, when Christians and Jews sit together in unity and fellowship and warmth, what we do is disgusting. It's an offense to people in ISIS, and I celebrate. They do not understand. They will never understand that kind of generous, loving world. It's too light for them. Friends, I had the privilege this afternoon of going to, into a Jewish family's home to do a blessing of uh, a marriage, 25th anniversary, and they asked me to come bless their marriage. Where else would an Episcopal priest get that kind of privilege? Can I tell you that when our new rabbi was being interviewed by B'nai Vale, by the way, he's a commander in the Navy, he was in his dress whites for a Friday, that Mark and Steve and Brooks were invited to lunch before he was hired to interview the rabbi came. That was an interesting lunch. We had a terrific time. Can I tell you that when we stand together in harmony and fellowship, we stand against the darkness. We stand against the terror. We stand against this kind of uh, destruction. And we have a privilege of doing that right here in this valley, right here in this building. Can I tell you finally that um, I think we're called to stand as citizens of a wonderful country. As I prayed about this message, I realized that with the collapse of mainline Protestant Christianity in the United States, all the vocabulary of these hymns and these readings all of a sudden won't make sense to people that are not religious. When we say God has blessed America, how are anybody supposed to know what the word blessed means? They don't have any understanding. How would anybody know? It took the destruction of Jerusalem to have our Jewish forebears understand that when God said they were chosen, they were not chosen to be elevated above the world. They were chosen to serve the world. I hope we understand as we celebrate our country, that our country is blessed, I believe, not to be elevated above, but to reach out in service, to share the blessings that we have been given. Can I tell you that this is why the pastors fought, whether you knew it or not, behind the scenes, to have a pastor and a rabbi at the Christmas tree blessing. It made a debate freeze that night. Was anybody out at the Christmas tree blessing? Larry was there. Can I tell you that it doesn't seem like a big deal to you, but to us to be in the public square to say a word of blessing in a public place is a big deal. Can I tell you that this is why we took a perfectly good diesel truck and drove it through thousands and thousands of people with big pictures of the chapels to say welcome to the interfaith chapels. We are here. Now no one told us that that parade route was approximately 18 miles long. <laughs> Our five and six and seven and eight year old children started to look like the Israelites in the wilderness dropping from fatigue. It's not very Christian to say, two more miles, come on. We're, I thought, my God, we're going to Avon here in this parade. But do you know the number of people, and I kid you not, that I have never seen in my life who started applauding? Adults, not because we were given candy. Adults, when we, that float went by, it was so encouraging. Do you know that we have a place at the 9 11 memorial services when we do them? That we have a place on Veterans Day 
out here in Edwards to say a prayer. That we are involved in the community as Christians. And that is a privileged place. That's why I will never refuse a funeral request. As long as I'm rector of our church, if people ask us to conduct a funeral, my answer will always be yes. No matter where they come from. We're partners. We're involved. We are a part of this community. Find me a nonprofit in this community where one of our members is not in service or in leadership. You can. We're out there. And we need to be. Friends, ISIS and caliphates and Sharia law do not get to have the last word. God himself gets to have everything. And we stand on this holiday weekend as Christians, as interfaith believers, and as Americans. Proud about the blessings that we've received. Come unto me, all you who are heavy laden and burdened. Jesus says, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is so light. Cast your cares upon me, Jesus says. And I will give you rest for your souls. May God bless you and this great country. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.